testing. Can anyone online hear me? Thank you all for coming to the Fort Vancouver Regional Library District Board of Trustees meeting. I'm now calling this meeting to order. Um, did Vikram get online? Okay, currently we have no online attendees. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I'll second. Any further discussion? Can we get a roll call vote, please? Marianne Duncan Cole. A. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. Megan Dugan. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion passes. Well, I am very happy to welcome Jennifer Giltrop to her first meeting as our new executive director. We are very excited for this new era under her leadership. Thank you to Justin for serving as interim ED and for making Jennifer's transition as smooth as possible. We're now gonna open up the public comments portion of our meeting. You will have two minutes to speak. We'll take one hour to hear your comments. No clapping or noise during or between speakers. Please know inappropriate language and be respectful of one another. Please direct your comments to the board and not the audience. No playing of recordings or videos and please just say your name when you get to the microphone. Our first speaker tonight is Daria Ruggles. <laughs> Hello, I'm Daria Ruggles, a volunteer commissioner serving my third term. Thank you all for serving on this board. You may be on the most important board of all. You are charged with no less than the protection of democracy and preserving the right of intellectual freedom. I come to you today as a private citizen who cares deeply about public libraries, the heart of our communities, and our staff, the heart of our libraries. Public libraries are a cornerstone of democracy, that lofty truth, but also provide vital resources, including for those most in need. No matter who you are, the library is here for you, for your inquiry, for personal development, however you define it. Offering dedicated human help staff and the assurance that your process is confidential. I wanna to talk to you about two things. One is ensuring our public library is a welcoming place for everyone, and two, ensuring staff who make our library services possible receive fair compensation. We all have ideas of how to live, love, and protect our families. The library is not the place to impose these ideas. Constitutional rights, tolerance, and basic civility all require public libraries to remain a safe place for everyone. This means no censorship of any kind, however strongly felt or slyly implemented. It means however you choose to identify, you deserve to be respected and represented with materials and included in all aspects of library service. It is fair. And we need to honor the people that bring our libraries to life. Without them, we are nothing more than warehouses. We demand more of our frontline library staff than ever. Our staff directly interface with the reality of inequality homelessness and despair and earn the dignity of a living wage daily. The library stands for inclusion. Please ensure this fairness for all, including staff. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Wasmus. Good evening. My name is Emily Lostness and I use she, her pronouns, and I am a resident of Vancouver. Thank you to the board for letting me speak here tonight in support of express, of support of expression as a fundamental human right that it is. 
Public libraries are spaces dedicated to knowledge and learning for expanding our understanding of the world and its people, past and present, who call it home. Like humans, libraries are hardwired for connection. We can get lost in great stories, seeing ourselves in characters who were conceptualized hundreds or even thousands of years ago, and see how the past has laid the foundation for where we are today. Libraries teach us that in this great big world where every story is unique, we can find connection, a part of ourselves, in every one of them. This is what makes libraries scary for people who want to make our world smaller, darker, and less compassionate than it really is. This idea that, although they're taught otherwise, that they might find some similarities with those that they have been taught to fear. I'm sure today we'll hear how drag queens and other affirming uh, literature at, or not affir other affirming literature, but other aff affirming possibilities at the library are trying to indoctrinate children with their ideologies. As someone who has actually been to a drag queen story AR, I can tell you firsthand that uh, these scary ideologies are love, kindness, acceptance, and connection. There is no indoctrination, but merely a loving, safe space created where everyone is welcome, so long as you're not harming yourself or others. There will be people tonight that say that drag queens invoke gender confusion in kids and that this is harmful by nature. This doesn't happen. If your kid was questioning their gender, they were questioning it long before they saw a man in a wig reading if you give a mouse a cookie to them and their peers. What they did see is that this man in a wig was loved and accepted by their community, which isn't harmful, it's healing. This kind of revelation of recognizing that you're not alone and that people will love you and embrace you with open arms isn't harmful, it's life-saving. And that connection, this knowledge turned into empowerment is exactly what libraries Thank are for. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Quill Onstead. Hi, my name is Quill Onstead and my pronouns are they them. I'm here to speak in support of Drag Queen Story Hour as a gender queer member of the library community. Opponents of Drag Queen Story Hour believe that being LGBTQ plus is a new contagion. Kids see it on their Tiki Talks or read a book with rainbow cover and decide to try it on like the latest fashion. Okay, sure, let's pretend for a second that's actually true, but then why do seniors come out? I'm talking about people in their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. Bernie Wagenblast, voice of the New York subway system for decades, is a trans woman. She didn't transition until she was 65. There is no social cachet. She's more than aware of what life is like for trans women. She lived most of her life in a society that was openly homo and transphobic, but she still found the courage to stand up and say, this is me. Wanting queer youngsters to not have a lifetime of conditioning and trauma to unpack isn't child abuse. It is literally the opposite. Queer kids deserve to be safe just like any other kid. They shouldn't have to wait until they're adults to start living their truths. They sure, certainly shouldn't have to wait until they're 65. The library and programs like Drag Queen Story Hour show them they don't have to. Drag Queen Story Hour is a vital program that teaches kids about gender identity in an age-appropriate manner. Parents who do not approve of Drag Queen Story Hour do not have to bring their children to any Drag Queen Story Hour programs. Please allow the staff of FERL Libraries to present Drag Queen Story Hour and have the district live up to the ideals espoused in FERL Library's equity statement. Thank you for your service to the community. Our next speaker is Len. I still don't know how to use a microphone, so uh, bear with me here. Um, I did. Did I get a timer or? Uh, okay. Um, thank you for the board and everyone here for letting me speak today. My name is Len. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them. Um, 
and I am here today as a private citizen citizen to talk to you about equal representation and censorship in libraries. Um, it's been said today, in fact, that libraries are a cornerstone of democracy, um, and that's completely true. Um, what else is completely true is that there should be something in a library that represents everyone. Um, when I was younger, I didn't find anything in my libraries that represented me. It's very important for children and adults, everyone, to know that they are accepted, to know that there are people like them in the community. To that point, I live in Vancouver. This is my library. I am part of this community. The programs and the collection development that are part of libraries in my community should reflect me. It should not reflect just one facet of the community. Everyone in this room should find something in the library that makes them feel at home. And it's very important that you don't take away someone's home like that, where they can find themselves. Uh, I didn't really have anything written down for this. This is really last minute. So I think that's all I have. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Um, you do a very important job uh, managing the collection things. Uh, yeah, uh, cool, great, yeah. Our next speaker is Margot Logan. Can you hear me? Is that good? All right, thank you. I'm Margot Logan. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Very nice to meet you. Uh, this is a wonderful library. I mean, I just love coming here and the one at the Vancouver Mall is just is just really, really nice. So tonight I was going to uh, donate a DVD, uh, Unplanned, What She Saw Changed Everything. I did look, and you do have a copy of the book, and you already do have a copy of the DVD. <laughs> and uh, I would just really, um, you know, there's two extremes. On one extreme is um, killing full-term babies. On the other extreme is that women should have no birth control at all. And it's just, I think it's gotten hard over the years that these two extremes are always kind of fighting each other. And so I'm trying to go to the middle. And um, and I know that there is a change, like a couple years ago, the Portland City Council uh, approved bereavement leave for women who had abortions. And that told me that people were coming to the fact that it is a very emotional thing to not have your baby you know, whether it's early term, late term, or after. And this uh, movie is so wonderful. I mean, it really gets to the heart without uh, tearing down anybody. And we need to help young women. Young women really don't know. And so these extremes, I just have been trying for years to, to just get to the heart of the matter and there's no condemnation of women. It's just the things that's happened throughout history. And so if we can bring some healing and watching this film for young women or any women actually would be a healing matter. So thank you for already having it into your catalog. Great, our next speaker is Kay Ellison. Hey, Ellison, and I'm nervous. I cannot say how much I appreciate this library system. I grew up in Portland as a little baby boomer, and the difference between then, there, and now here is amazing. You were only allowed a few books. You had to bring them back in three weeks, or you got to pay a fine. Um, my dad uh, worked and had the car because we had one car. And so 
I wasn't taken to the library very often because he had two jobs. And so when we did get to go to the library, it was a wonderful thing. And, um, and yet you could only get the three books and anyway, so I appreciate here. I moved here 40 years ago and I loved being able to check out a whole bunch of books. When my kids were little, that's what we did. I was able to read so much to them all the time. Um, and the access here is so great. You can get online and of course they didn't do that when I was a kid. Um, but they, I love where I can put a book in and reserve it and then be able to come in here and check it out. And I realize that takes a lot of library system people to be able to get that book from one, to get it off the shelf anywhere, but to transport it and to get it here where I can walk in and pick it off the shelf. And, um, I just appreciate it so much. Um, I also like that when I've gotten a book on the shelf that people's from the library system got there, that I can walk in and, oh, there's another book. So the displays, I appreciate so much. I know that takes a lot of work, but it, thank you. Our next speaker is Dave Gallus. Good evening, board members, Jennifer, welcome. I'm Dave Gillis, security at Cascade Park Community Library. We have a paramount problem that affects all FERL employees. I want you to understand what an employee's life is like trying to live on the wages now paid by FERL. And folks, it isn't living, it's existing. When an employer employee has to worry about what bill won't get paid this payday, or they blew a tire and now have to borrow money from their parents, these are all very real scenarios, and I could go on ad infinitum. You claim that you want everyone to be empowered to succeed. You speak of equity. How is it equitable for your employees when they have workers living in their cars on government assistance or hitting the food banks after work? And yet you want them to be the best when they roll in every morning, smiling and ready to help the public in so many ways. And that is exactly what they do. I recently got the opportunity to see what a PSA is required to be fluent at to do their job. Whoa, how can you honestly tell yourselves that these jobs are worth only nine cents above the minimum wage? You have a group of people who for them, this is a full-time career, if not a calling, not a step-off job. It is time to quit using excuses for underpaying these remarkable individuals. There are millions in reserve. Couldn't a small percentage of these reserves be used to bring your employees up to a living wage that will allow them to actually take part in the communities that they work and live in? What we would like without worrying is to be able to pay our bills and still go for a slice or dinner with the family once a payday. You on the board, please let management know you will work with them to broker an equitable and living wage. And management, you need to step up to the table and realize this didn't happen overnight but needs to be remedied now. It is time for you to look at these most amazing people and realize that they can't live. And sadly, if they can't live, they will leave. If you can make this happen for all of your employees, then good on you. And if you don't, you won't make this happen for them, shame on you. Our next speaker is Mike Ellison. Yeah, my name is Mike Ellison, uh, born and raised in Vancouver. My pronouns are he, him, and I appreciate the time to speak to you tonight. Uh, and I want to salute uh, those that have spoke before me, uh, you know, with a, I salute their bravery for having a bit to lose in this situation. Um, the, uh, what, what I'd like to do is um, mention some of the things that I was looking at today in our policies, because I see great things in these policies. You know, our uh, first, our collection objectives. So it says that uh, Fort Vancouver Regional Library is responsible for providing materials to patrons of all ages 
backgrounds, and opinions. The collection taken as a whole will be unbiased and diverse and a diverse source of information representing as many viewpoints as possible. Subjects will be covered in sufficient depth and breadth to meet anticipated and expressed individual and community needs. The, the primary objectives of the collection will be to educate and inform and include also to develop the skills and abilities needed for personal success, to encourage and enhance personal, artistic, and intellectual growth. Another part of this says that no material will be excluded because of the race, nationality, religion, gender, sexual orientation, political or social views of either the author or the material. So this is how we represent democracy here. And I so appreciate your contributions to that. And I do know that okay, my time is up. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Randy Schmidt. Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. So tonight I'm gonna to propose the following common sense policy that's been recently been enacted by the Florida legislature with respect to school libraries. In Florida House Bill 1069 in section six, it states, parents shall have the right to read passages from any material that is subject to an objection. If the school board denies the parent to read the right to read the passages due to the content that meets the requirements under the subparagraph, which are all important pornographic material, the school board district shall discontinue the use of the material. So in layman's terms, it says, in essence, that if I were to come up here and read a passage from Gender Queer or Boys Aren't Blue, and you told me to stop reading that book because it was too graphic, which it is, then that book would be removed from the library. Now, why is that? Well, it's because we, as I shared last week, those books contain pornography. They're no different than Hustler or Penthouse. And we actually have quotes from people like Billie Eilish in our community that tell us that pornography destroyed them. It's not a benefit. We're not here to tell you to not carry books for alternate lifestyles. We're here to simply say, don't serve child porn. There are some that are going to say, well, this oppression is censorship. I find that ridiculous for these main reasons. Those books aren't banned. If you are a parent and you want that book, Amazon will deliver that book to your door in one day. It will be that quick. And so therefore, there's not banning anything. You don't even have the ability to ban anything. And if we want to say it's censorship, I also want to ask you, do you have the 2.6 million books on your shelf that were published just this year? If you do not, you are censoring every single one of those books. Well, of course you don't. You don't have the shelf space to put 2.6 million books every new year onto your shelves. You have to determine what you want based on the quality and the efficacy of those books. Thank you. Our next speaker is JJ Jacobs. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is JJ, and uh, and my pronouns are he, him, and I appreciate you guys letting me speak today. Um, I have been a library patron in Vancouver for more than 20 years, um, and I have always loved the library. Um, these days, mostly, I read books on through Libby, um, <laughs> and I use the library for board games and Hoopla and all of the random stuff that the library has, and I love the ways that it does allow me to read books that I otherwise might not be able to afford because that adds up. <laughs> um, as much as we say, oh, it's not banning books because you can still get them on Amazon. Not everyone has the ability to just buy endless books, especially those of us that are kind of voracious readers. <laughs> like it adds up. And that is a really cool part of the library because it allows people to connect. It allows that social connection and it does allow folks to see themselves reflected regardless of what their background looks like. Um, let's see. 
Oh, I was going to say, I, I remember the day that this location opened. I came here just to stand in line for opening day, and I was so excited to get to see what this all looked like. It was a big upgrade from the previous location, which is still just down the street, but it has been such a cool community space. And I remember coming here for everything from studying for grad school exams with my friends um, to, you know, checking out books, putting things on hold, all kinds of stuff. But I appreciate activities like drag queen story hour i appreciate the materials that are available and the fact that as a queer person i can see representation in those books thank you our next speaker is uh denmark witcher Hello, I'm a teacher. I had 200 students a day. You are teachers too. Now let's see, what's the population of Southwest Washington? Quite a difference. You're responsible for the education of a great many more than 200 people. Thank you for that. This institution is the most welcoming and egalitarian institution that I can think of. In recent years when our basic democratic freedoms were challenged by our federal government under certain administrations, I had to thank the American Civil Liberties Union and the American Library Association for standing up to the government and protecting my freedom, your freedom, everybody's freedom. The library doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to you, it doesn't belong to him or her or them. It belongs to us. God bless the library. And our final speaker for the evening is Pepper Kim. I'm Pepper Kim, and um, I love the library. I'm a retired English teacher, taught in uh, Legacy Alternative High School, 25 years, where we created a safe space for a lot of the community that have spoken here today. I'm proud of that. Um, if I hadn't have been an English teacher, I would have been a librarian. I moved and in, into my house because it was near the library. That's how much I love the library. It's next to education, it's next in my heart. Um, I wanna speak about not only creating a safe space um, for everybody in our community, but the fact that if you uh, mute and minimize the diversity and variety of offerings in the library, you're actually muting our own human experience. I like to read in a diverse, multiple viewpoints, perspectives. It widens me and I grow as a human being. So we can all grow. I, you know, and one of my favorite things that the librarians do is the staff picks because otherwise I might just stay in my own little lanes. But those staff picks, I can't even tell you how many books that I've read that I never might have encountered otherwise and that have expanded me as a human being. So thank you for your important work. Keep going. I value you and I think our community does too. Thanks. Are there any online comments? All right, we still have time left. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment that hasn't yet? Just say your name when you come up to the microphone. Thanks. My name is Lynette Black. I started my career with uh, FBRL in 1992 when I filled out the application for $4.35 minimum wage. The FBRL offered about $2 more than that. 
back then, a mortgage was not $3,700. A one-bedroom apartment was not almost $1,500. Your car payment is not almost $400. Your groceries, well, you know, each to their own, but you know groceries have gone up. Um, and I think I would like to get back to the old FBRL, the ones that, um, you know, showed support for their staff. Um, we've been asked to place trust in a new executive director, and I hope, I hope we can have that. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yes. Say your name when you get to the microphone, please. Thank you, library board members, and welcome, Jennifer. Um, my comment will be short and sweet, kind of echoes um, my comment. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Gary Wilson, did I not say that? My, my apologies. Um, yeah, thank you, library board members. Mine's going to be short and sweet so I can re-say it. And thank you, library board members, for your service. And again, welcome, Jennifer. And um, my comment, again, short and sweet, echoes my comments from the past few months, just Please continue to err on the side of caution when considering your most vulnerable patrons, the children. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Any other comments? Three online. Okay, we'll take the online ones and then we'll come back if there's anyone else. Is there a last name? Okay. Uh, Karen online, please go ahead. Um. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So thank you to uh, the council and thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak our uh, viewpoints and express our concerns. Um, I am a patron of the library and have been for many, many years. I bring my grandkids to the library and they are just ferocious readers. Uh, we greatly enjoy the, the the freedom to be able to go there and to look at a variety of books and a diversity of books. Um, I am an African-American woman and I have been in business and uh, have experienced many different prejudices in life. Uh, I feel the library should be a safe place and it should be representative of all peoples, of all races, of all genders. And I just want to say a few quotes by our wonderful uh, Maya Angelou, who was a prophetic and just profound visionary of our day and of people and our society. Uh, the good, the bad, the wonderful, and the not so beautiful. Um, this is by Maya Angelou. Uh, her quote is, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past it threatens the future and renders the present inaccessible. In order to create a world that values our unique experiences and identities, we have to move beyond our own preconceived notions to fully embrace others. Doing so opens up a world of possibilities and failing to do so threatens our future. Um, the other thing that Maya Angelou speaks about is empathize with others' experience. Demonstrating empathy and understanding requires courage, and courage is necessary to create inclusive environments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, go ahead. Okay, who, who's next then? Judy, if you want to make a comment, please respond online. And then next up will be Lucy Aspen. Please go ahead. Um, this is Judy. How can I beat Maya Angelou? She said it all. Thanks. And welcome, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. What was the next name? Lucy Aspen, please go ahead. Okay. Um... I am a um, FVRL staff member. Um, so I want to, as a staff member, I want to welcome Jennifer. You certainly will have your challenges to tackle. As you heard from some of our, my colleagues there, or our colleagues, I should say. Um, now I want to speak as I'm taking my off my staff 
cap and I'm putting on my taxpayer and um, patron cap. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Actor, we have a problem uh, here with the, you know, the book banning um, direction that people want to go. And this is not just the public. Uh, I know that there, there are uh, some of the, the people, some of the members of the board that want to go that direction as well. At least that's very much how they indicate indicate their um, their position. So I think there is uh, certainly there is a challenger there too. Uh, so I want to ask you as a patron that loves to see everything that the library has, wants her five year old granddaughter to read everything, almost everything that the library has. Um, I actually don't want her to read the things that people, you know, like the book banners want to keep in the library. Those are the, the ones that, that are a problem for me, the uber Christian and whatnot. That's the problem for me and not the other stuff. But guess what? We need to have those two. If there's something that is not offensive to me and to everyone else, we're not doing our job. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Is there anyone else online? No? Anyone in the room that would like to comment? All right, thank you all for your public comments. Um, I would like to encourage everyone, it sounds like from some of the comments, people are having trouble finding books for whatever reason that you can always fill out purchase requests and submit them through our website if you're not finding books that you're looking for. Um, I would, Jennifer, how many um, books have trustees asked to ban? None that I'm aware of. How many books overall have been banned recently that you know of? Uh, Lynn can correct me, but I don't believe we've banned any. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're now going to begin the reports. And so first up is Molly Gunderson with Vancouver Community Library Branch Report. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me this time to talk about all of the great things we've been doing here at the Vancouver Community Library. Um, some of you may know, others may not, I am the newest branch manager in FERL, and um, I started back in July, so I'm going on month five here at the library. Um, it has been interesting and challenging, but also very fun. Um, no day has been the same, and I've never bored. So um, with that, we will go to the next slide. I stuck some quick facts here in this first slide. We are um, 12 and a half years in our current location, and I still hear people refer to this as the new building. Um, it's 83,000 square feet, so it's gigantic, and it's staffed by, well, at last count, 55.40 um, staff, but that fluctuates. Um, I think it's a little more now. You can see our CERC stats there, um, over 600,000 books and visits to the library, um, over 240,000. So this is last year's numbers and I'm hoping that um, 2023 will show an increase. Um, Summer at your library is what SAYL stands for, um, had over 1,300 readers registered. So we're doing great, we're a big building, lots of people. Um, in five minutes or so, there is no way I will be able to cover the past year, and I wasn't here for a lot of it. So I am just showing snapshots today. You're going to get what you get, and it does not reflect um, the year in uh, total. It just reflects what I chose to put in the slides. Um, so I'm told that in January and February of this past year, we have new carpet installed. Um, and that was a huge undertaking. Um, we had to shift everything, box things up, move things around. And then once the carpet was installed, put it all back together again. Um, and 
we were closed for two weeks to our patrons, but at the same time, we were still answering the phones and doing curbside service. So we didn't really close. Next slide, please. Um, so jumping ahead to August, because, you know, I wasn't here for most of the stuff. So we're just going to focus on what I want to talk about. Art for Art was one of my first events um, at the library, and it was really great to see. Um, this is a fundraiser that the Friends of the Library put on every year, and it's um, a very popular event. The little, um, uh, what do you call it? Little wooden boxes that you see on the um, frames there are given out in May to anyone who wants to paint or do a collage, and then they're turned in and sold in August for $30 a piece. So you could be getting, you don't know whose art you're purchasing. It could be, you know, a, a new and budding artist, or it could be someone pretty famous. Um, so I believe we raised, and I have notes here that I'm going to look at. Oh, we raised $3,700 um, during the sale in um, August, August 4th and 5th, and it was attended by over 200 people. All right, next slide. This is another um, event that happened at the library um, based around the, not the lunar eclipse. Oh my gosh, Molly. It's the annular eclipse. Sorry for that typo. Um, anyway, <laughs> This um, shows that the clouds parted just enough for us to have a little gathering on the terrace. Um, we gave out glasses throughout the district, but um, I just wanted the, to show the snapshot of what our event looked like. Um, and we also had a celestial scavenger hunt throughout the building for that month. All right, next slide. We do a ton of programming and outreach that I couldn't even cover if I had the whole hour to talk about. Um, so I thought I'd just show three of um, my favorites. Once a month, we have an event called Read to, the, or a program called Read to the Dogs. And this gives um, hesitant readers an opportunity to read out loud to a friendly or sleepy face. Um, and, you know, no judging from the dogs. They just want to listen. Um, and we hear so many stories from parents about how this has helped the children um, be more comfortable with reading out loud and reading in general. It also helps um, families or children who are a little afraid of dogs um, to get comfortable with them. The middle slide is, or the middle photos are from the um, October 21st event we had in um, Esther Short Park for Dia de los Muertos. And we had uh, hundreds of books that we gave out. It was very well attended. And um, there were a lot of Spanish speaking families there. And um, the craft was to make a skeleton. So that's what they're showing. Another popular event or program we do is um, board games once a month, every Sunday afternoon. And um, you can see Robert, our staff person there, playing Scrabble with a patron, um, also very well attended and a fun event. All right, next slide, please. Here I'm just highlighting some partnerships. We have so many that uh, wouldn't even fit on one slide, but. Um, the ones that uh, I wanted to point out here, um, we worked with Share Vancouver. Um, I can't remember how many years in a row we've done that, but we provide summer lunches in this room um, to kids and their families when school is not in session. Um, once a week, uh, our senior library associate, uh, senior library assistant Rachel goes to the juvenile detention center. Um, and she brings books and programs to the teens there. I had the opportunity to go in late October and it was uh, really wonderful to see Rachel um, had a slide presentation on, on photography, uh, kind of modern art discussion that we had. Um, and it was really fun to hear um, the teens opinions and ideas about modern art. Um, we bring books and library cards to local senior living centers, and we work with Mercy Corps, Fourth Plain Forward Score, Southwest Washington, and Goodwill Industries on a regular basis. Okay, next slide. 
All right. So the building experience, this is um, my little passion project <laughs> that I'm highlighting. Um, my first couple of weeks on the second floor where the staff work, I noticed that on the landing between the second floor and the third floor, um, we had a summer at your library display of Furbies and other like 90s um, toys and gadgets. And one day I came to work and there was nothing in the window. And I thought, oh, that's kind of sad. I miss seeing the kids stop on the landing and look in the window. So I um, bought a fish aquarium and stuck four goldfish in there um, to draw kids and their families to that window and to give like a little, you know, burst of joy on the landing. Um, I didn't know what to name the fish and I thought it'd be fun if the patrons named them. And so we had a naming contest recently um, and you can see the results. So the three goldfish are cheddar, peaches, and spicy tuna. And then the black fish is named Leviathan. So um, this is a little bit of whimsy and that's kind of my, um, I don't know, my aesthetic. And I'm hoping to do more of this type of thing in the building, um, but we'll see. Watch this space. Next slide. Um, another um, thing I wanted to point out just because I like them a lot is our interactive displays. This is you know, long before I got here um, that the staff have been doing it. But for um, the month of November, we had the six word story that patrons could write on these little cards. And some of the things people came up with were fascinating. So as you can see, then the vampire said, bite me. <laughs> I can't ask her, she's dead. That's just the creativity and the um, innovation that people come up with when they have a little card in front of them. It's fun to see. All right, next slide is another interactive display, which is um, currently in the, in the atrium right now. So it's going to be up for the month of December. If you come back, feel free to fill one of these out. It's about sending kindness, spreading kindness. Um, one of our staff um, made these little envelopes. So each envelope is different. I really like the googly eyes and the sardines. Um, so you can see a couple of examples. It's always my favorite when you come to the library and I hope you have a good day. If something bad happens, you're not alone. So you can take a message and you can leave a message and get a little warmth in your heart. All right, next slide, please. Um, we wouldn't be a library without the staff here um, and the staff make it all happen. You can see um, we do this uh, book face Friday every week on Instagram. And here are some examples of those book faces. But I really um, get excited about coming to work every day because of the staff in this building. Um, they're all very hardworking and dedicated. And in my short time here, I felt very supported and um, helped by my staff. Um, they'll answer any question and drop anything they're doing to help me out. And um, I just, I love coming to work because of that. And I try to do the same for them. All right, next slide. And last but not least, we have a wonderful Friends of the Library group. Um, you can see them kind of in the background. And for next year's report, I'm going to take better pictures of the Friends of the Library. This doesn't do them justice. But you can see Kay back there and Charlie and Milton. Um, they are serving cake. It's July 12th, I believe, is the anniversary of this building opening and the Friends um, offer cake to the patrons every year. So thank you, friends, and thank you um, to those that I didn't mention, but I do want to say Nancy's name because she runs the book nook, and that is also... Oh, oh hi, Nancy! You're here! Yay! Um, and we just had a big book sale, and Nancy did a fabulous job of running it, so thank you, thank you. And I believe that is my last slide, so... Any questions? Go ahead. Hi, Molly. Hi, Olga. Can you um, answer what's going well and what could go 
better? Um, what's going well, all of the things I said, um, what could be better? I would say we're still um, not up to our staffing levels. Um, we have an engagement manager starting on December 18th, and that's going to help me out a lot because I've only had one assistant, you know, it, they're essentially assistant managers, the access manager and the engagement manager. And so Maureen and I have been doing our best, but programming um, this past year or more maybe has been uh, a little tricky without having someone in charge of it. Um, but, you know, everyone is doing their best. Um, we're also down many SLAs, the senior library assistants. Um, so we hope to bulk up that part of the staffing as well. Thank you. I love the book faces. Those are really funny. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you. Next, we'll have Atar with the October financial statement. Good evening. Um, tonight we have the um, October 2023 financial statements, uh, starting with the statement of cash. Um, at the end of October, year-to-date revenues were at $21.8 million and year-to-date expenditures $25 million. Cash balance was at $17.2 million. Uh, moving on to the statement of revenues, Property tax revenue for October totaled $4.4 million. Year to, year to date, excuse me, is at 75% of budget. October leasehold excise tax was $237. Other general tax was $9,600, comprising of Skamania County private harvest. Um, October state forest boards revenue was $920, with year to date at $15.7,000. Um, or 10% of budget. Um, last year, state forest boards ended the year at $41,000 or 18% of budget. Um, October charges for services um, brought in $15,800. Under miscellaneous, October investment interest revenue was $39,400. Um, Excuse me, total October revenue was $4.47 million. Year to date budget percentage for total operating revenue was at 69%, and total revenue was at 64%. Moving on to the statement of expenses. Um, at the end of October, we would expect uh, total expenses for year to date to be at 83.33% of budget. Um, October personnel costs were $1.36 million. Um, with year-to-date at 79% of budget, compared to 75.7% last year, um, running lower than budget due to 21 open positions. Supplies and small equipment um, for the month of October was $190,000, with year-to-date at 63.9%. October library excuse me, October library materials activity was $303,000, or 67% of budget. Under other services charges, October had $176,000 of activity with year-to-date at 75% of budget. Um, capital outlay for buildings owned had $107,000 of activity in October under operating expenditures, um, which included payments uh, related to the new Grand Boulevard OC and um, the Woodland Building Project. Total October expenditures were at $2.1 million. Um, Year-to-date budget percentage for total expenditures was at 74%. Questions? Yeah. You've had to manage several building projects. Are they all coming in within budget? Are you comfortable that you're going to be able to close out all the new construction at budget or near 
Um, I am comfortable that we'll be within our um, capital outlay budgets on the state limit expenses. Um, if, if that answers your question. That answers it. Thank you. And congratulations on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know I just addressed your question, but part of that is, you know, we expected Woodland to start earlier this year. So that that's part of it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I reviewed the October financials and found things in order. We'll go ahead and do the consent agenda, which contains the expenditures and the minutes from November. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? Can we get a roll call vote, please? Marianne Duncan Cole. A. Penny Love Pensley. Aye. Megan Dugan. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion passes. We'll move on to the business portion of our meeting. I believe, Justin, you wanted to share some information before we start the hearings, correct? First, okay. We have two public hearings tonight. The first one will be regarding the 2023 budget amendment. The purpose of this public hearing is providing a brief description of the 2023 budget amendment and the action that the hearing body may legally take. The ground rules for the hearing are the public comment portion of the public hearing will be set to 30 minutes. Each individual will be allowed two minutes to speak during the public comment portion. Comments during public hearing are limited only to the topic at hand. Please avoid repetitive comments, unruly behavior. If there's a group, please ask one person to be the speaker or representative. I now open the public comment portion of the public hearing, 2023 budget amendment. Each person may have up to two minutes to speak and please say your name as you approach the microphone. Are there any comments? Oh, before we take comments. Okay, I'm sorry. Justin's going to give an overview before we take comments. So we'll get to you guys here in just a moment. So as Chair Morgan indicated, the purpose of this public hearing is to go over the 2023 budget amendment. There is a staff report in the board packet for you. Um, the purpose of the budget amendment is that whenever we, we receive more revenue or greater have greater expenses than we anticipated when we were building the prior year's budget, we need to go back and amend the budget. So we are updating the 23 budget to reflect more revenue and to reflect that we have used some reserve funds to help with the OC Operation Center remodel and to cover year-to-date expenses for the Woodland Project. On the revenue side, we have unanticipated revenue of $311,000 this year. That comes from the PEG grant from the city of Vancouver, which stands for the Public Education and Government Grant. That is, it is essentially a pass through from Comcast to the city to us to help offset some of our broadband expenses connecting the public to the internet. And then we have seen $250,000 in unanticipated um, investment interest this year, which is good. Expense On the expense side, any changes in expenses are focused on the building's owned line. We've reduced the building's owned line from $5,500,000 down to $3,311,000. We are amending this category to reflect that we spent from reserves to offset some spending on the operation center remodel and for charges for the woodland project in 2023 year to date which is going to be around 1.7 million dollars so staff's recommendation to the trustees is that you approve resolution 23-25 to adopt the 2023 budget amendment indicating revenue of 34 million two hundred and thirteen thousand five hundred dollars
All right, we're ready for public comment. Each person may have up to two minutes and please say your name before you begin. Would anyone like to make a comment? And also, are there any online? Okay. Okay. So no one. All right. Board of Trustees, do you have any comments to add? I'm glad to see we increased revenue unexpectedly with interest. That's a real bonus. Thank you. I'm concerned always that um, we, when we take from the reserves, but with the number of building projects you have, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> All right, I will now close the public comment portion of the public hearing 2023 budget amendment. Do any board members of the hearing body have any additional questions? All right, hearing none, I formally close the public hearing comments. The next steps are to adopt resolution 2023-25-2024-3, adopting the 2023 budget amendment. <laughs> I ask for a motion to adopt this resolution as presented. So moved. Is there a second? I second. Is there any further discussion? I move this to a vote. Olga Hodges? Aye. Murray Coffey? Aye. Megan Dugan? Aye. Penny Love Hensley? Aye. Mary Ann Duncan Cole? Aye. Vikram Katwani? Christy Morgan? Aye. Motion to approve the 2023 budget amendment is approved. The public hearing for the 2023 budget amendment is now closed. All right, we're going to begin the next one. This is the public hearing for the 2024 budget approval. <clears throat> the purpose of this public hearing is to provide a brief description of the 2024 budget and the action that the hearing body may legally take. The ground rules for this hearing are the same. The public comment portion of the public hearing will be set to 30 minutes. Each individual will be allowed two minutes to speak during public comment. Comments during public hearing are limited to only the topic at hand. Please avoid repetitive comments and really behavior. If there is a group, please ask one person to be the speaker. I now open the public comment portion of the public hearing for the 2024 budget. Did you have, so, okay, we'll move to Justin for some information before we start comments. Thank you, Chair Morgan. I'll try to keep it brief. This year's 2024 budget is focused on continuity of excellent customer service and keeping focused on our Woodland and Washougal efforts. The budget reflects our commitments to our communities by making efforts to fully staff all of our locations and departments so that we can continue to provide you with the resources and programming that our communities expect. And as well as fully staffing and maintaining our offerings of services through these community and click attack county bookmobiles and by being responsive to patron needs in regards to our collection. The 24 budget assumes a 5.4% increase to personnel expenses that will be driven by wage adjustments and increases in the cost of benefits. It also reflects our commitments to the communities of Woodland and Washougal by allocating $4 million from reserves to these projects. The budget changes in revenue. The budget accounts for the 1% levy rate increase that was voted on by the trustees in November. The levy rate for 2024 will be set at $0.26 cents per $1,000 of assessed value. This is down from the 23 rate of $0.27. Cents. As an intercounty library district, our statutory levy rate is $0.50 cents per 1,000 of assessed value of property throughout the system. We are prevented from having more than a 1% increase in revenue from the property tax levy. This means that the, as property values increase, our levy rate, rate reduces and order us to keep us below the 1% limit. It's a safeguard against excess taxation, but it presents challenges as expenses generally increase at a greater rate than 1% than the 1% increase supports. 
the overall increase this year that we're projecting from the levy is around $280,000. The budget shows an increase in federal in lieu taxes. In lieu taxes are for federal lands within the service area that are non taxable. And this adjustment is based on prior year's revenue. It reflects a decrease in state board, forest board revenue, which is what we call timber tax. And again, this is based on 23 revenue. There is an increase in the charges for services line to reflect actuals as our service levels restore to pre-pandemic levels. This is for things like our lost and damaged items, fees for items, and the non-resident borrowers fee in Collins County. Our revenue from E-rate for providing phone and internet services to the public is reducing to reflect that E-rate now only supports internet network access. It predicts a decrease in sale of assets, and this is based on, again, 2023 activity. We are expecting continued growth of investment interest. And the budget in the revenue side accounts for increased revenue from reserves from 2.5 million in 2023 to 4 million in 24. This is to help us complete the Woodland project as well as to assign further reserves to the Washougal project. Using the reserves in this way means that Woodland is fully funded and that Washougal has around 4 million assigned. Overall, FVRL's operating budget will increase around $2.8 million in 2024. This, is, can, this um, includes the 1% levy increase and the transfer in from reserves for the projects. On the expenditure side, we are budgeted at 100% of anticipated revenue, and the expenditures reflect a 1.6% increase in the overall operation, the operational expenses. The expenditures project a 5.4% increase in wage and benefits. And this budget anticipates us being fully staffed in all of our branches and in our central departments. There will be a decrease in the library books and materials line to reflect current collection use patterns. Circulation district-wide is rebounding, but it is more on the e-content side of things right now. There is a decrease in the expenses in the buildings non-owned based on the activities year to date in 2023. And there is a decrease in the buildings owned due to expenses being offset by the foundation's $2.5 million in capital grants that they received for us on in behalf of the Woodland Project. So a recommendation is that the trustees approve resolution 23-26 which will set FVRL's 2024 budget at $36,682,500. A question. We've added several um, new buildings, and I'm assuming they're rather larger than the uh, prior buildings. Has that placed any kind of a problem for staffing? Have you had to increase staffing to meet those new buildings' needs? Well, Washougal, we do not have a firm square footage quite yet for that building. We will, um, as that becomes known, of course, we will take a look at the staffing needs. For Woodland, we're not anticipating needing to increase the staffing levels for that facility due to the fact that it'll be on one floor as opposed to the two that it's on now. And ideally, it's being planned with an eye towards line of sight for all the all the space. Oh, okay. Thank you. I now open the public comment portion of the public hearing 2024 budget. Each person may have up to two minutes to speak and please say your name before you begin. Please watch online for any comments. And does anyone here wish to make a comment? Hello, my name is Randy Schmidt. So Maybe you said it in your numbers and I just but couldn't hear it, but I didn't hear the, if you were increasing the pay of the staff or not, because that was something that was addressed earlier tonight in some of the other public comments. And the reason I ask if you're not a, looking at the pay increase and you end up with some kind of a conflict like you had in the schools for teachers and things like that, 
then how would you go about then covering that? Because like one of the concerns I see is that we see like in Portland Public Schools, they've come out very publicly recently after a strike and then settling that strike and then coming back and saying, well, we just settled for a contract that we can't afford. So where are we going to get the money? Um, so that's one of the things, that's the only reason I'm asking the question is, are you looking forward to see, can you cover those funds? Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to try to answer that question? I was trying yes. to figure out who to ask it. Um, so we do have um, some anticipated increases built into the budget. Uh, we still are in um, collective bargaining with our union, so we don't know exactly where that will settle. Uh, but certainly we have uh, built in some increases into the budget, yes. And we've had increased costs, increased costs for benefits as well, based on what our providers are telling us. Thank you. Any other public comment? And none online, correct? Okay. Board of Trustees, do you have any comments to add? I wanted to be sure I understood. Are we putting in four million to Washugo or that they have a total of four million? That is based on our reserve, our reserve plan over the last couple of years, including the money that we were able to allocate from reserves in twenty four. It brings the total for that project up to around four million. Um, I noticed in the twenty four draft there is no line for the PEG grant. Is that a one time only grant from the city? I'm not sure about whether or not it is one time, but it would be, um, it's a good question, Megan. I'll have to look at that and get back to you. Just since it was unanticipated this year, maybe we could mm -hmm. anticipate it next year. I don't think <laughs> we can anticipate it next year. I, I think that they thought it was ending um, and they weren't going to receive it in 20, or we weren't going to receive it in 23, but uh, that's probably something we need to check into further. Thank you. So I have a question also. Um, my concern is around the line of library books and materials amount being reduced by eighty thousand um, dollars. I we heard from the audience. It sounds like people aren't finding books, the concerns that look like them, or they can't find the books they're looking for. Are we purchasing enough books? Represent you know? Are we purchasing diverse collections? Are I hear from homeschoolers we can't find books that we want to check out people have stopped coming to the library so i'm sure we're not getting as many requests as before so i'm just curious books is what we do why are we cutting eighty thousand out of the budget i would like yeah. lynn to help answer this question go ahead please thank you hi um so we do still buy everything that, well most things that people suggest to us like you're saying um we're just seeing only about 70 percent of the physical item checkouts that we saw pre-pandemic now. So it's quite a lot of, you know, a lot of items. And our total circulation is is up some. So that's really good. It's just people seem to have switched format, especially during the pandemic. It was kind of going that way anyway, but a little more slowly. And then the pandemic kind of accelerated all of that. So a lot more people are using, just for instance, uh, downloadable audio. We had 69,000 checkouts in November for downloadable audio, just for downloadable audio. Well, 9,000 of those were me. Yeah, 9,000 were you. Yeah, I, I wrote that down. <laughs> so, Don't um, the electronic ones cost more, though? How are, like, how is that balancing out then? They cost more up front. No one ever spills coffee on them, though, and they're never overdue. <laughs> so, you know. Um, and then this amount can be reviewed later if we find yes, that we need we can, more. Yes, we back. can adjust things later. Okay. Thank you. I have a okay. question. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question. On the um, digital checkouts that you mentioned, I'm still kind of learning how we register them. Um, is that with somebody checking it out and using it or just checking it out and it can sit unused, which I'm guilty of. I'm sorry. Um, we count it when it's checked out. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I just... Uh, I'm... It's the same as if you check out a book and you don't read it. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> same thing. Yeah. Okay. So it's technically... It's checkouts. Got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Other... I think one thing um, that Lynn didn't mention that I will is we have to also understand because the circulation has slowed in the physical items, what we're seeing in our libraries, and of course I have a lot more to see and learn about this and dig into, but is that we have collection maintenance activities going on all, all the time. And some of that is making sure that books that are no longer of useful life for lots of different reasons are being weeded out of the collection. But we can't weed at a pace that would get to the fact that you'd need to add one book and in order to do that, to put it on the shelf, you have to take one away. So we're really going to be digging in uh, this year to really look at our collection sizes and specifications and under understand with the change in user circulation, what that means from right sizing the collection overall. So we could indeed come back to you and say, and if there's money available, adjust those lines. But I think uh, right now, what we're seeing based on current year budget, that we will still be able to have a very robust collection at the $3,720,000. And that, um, I mean, it's probably obvious, and I'm sure this isn't what happens, but the unused books aren't the ones that'll be weeded out that are sitting in storage somewhere, right? We're just taking tally of the ones that are on the shelves being passed up continuously. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Question, we're not the only library in the four county area. And um, some, are they facing the same pressures? Are we seeing different, desires for books based on what the schools are are they changing curriculum and then all of a sudden you need to know about venezuela because we never talked about it before what kind of communication are you having from that that kind of pushes you then to get new books well justin's division uh works with the schools so okay um but i yeah you want to talk about that well i can talk about some of our partnership efforts with the schools, but I don't know that we have a dialogue with them in terms of say how their curriculum changes are going to show up in our collection development mm -hmm. um, practices. Okay. Did that answer your question? It does. I mean, he has an answer. I'm wondering if sometimes <laughs> that we may need to do a little bit more of that. Um, we do have 27 school districts in our yeah. service area. It's a, it's a lot of school districts and then a lot of schools within those districts. It's a, it's a lot of people. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm not sure, yeah. even though I'm married to a ex-middle school teacher, uh, got kind of twisted over the time, unfortunately. Uh, the If there are just kinds of changes and... Um, you know, styles going in and out of some of these. I know some, they buy new uh, textbooks pretty regularly, mm -hmm. at least up in Skamania County. And um, sometimes there's just a whole new focus on those. And all of a sudden, is that putting demand on you? Would it have helped to know mm -hmm. that that was going on? Yeah, I think in general, um, 27 school districts is a lot, and we also have homeschool um, children as well, um, and the library is here to support all of our learners, and I, I think that um, every library across every public library across the country is always trying to support student success and the educators to the best of our ability, and so I, I think that it's not an easy answer. Uh, at all. Uh, and the schools have been under tremendous pressure for lots of different reasons. Many do not have libraries in their schools, and we can't make those assumptions either. Uh, so we're a public library. We serve a little different purpose than a school library, quite a bit different. Uh, but I think that we can dig into that from even looking at the kinds of items that are checked out by ages, et cetera, to really know, do we see really curriculum-based support happening? But the more we can make connections between our team and the school teams to really support curriculum, 
that's what we want to do. Obviously, schools also more and more are trying to point their kids to what's available online, databases, et cetera, which we have a plethora of that. We're very fortunate to offer that. Uh, but we also have to be concerned, and we've talked about this, that not everybody has that access from home. And so it's a, it's a tough balance. And I think that we can always do better. We can always do better in understanding what the needs of our students are. I have a question again. Um, is is there any uh, observable trend as far as what books are being underutilized, like technical books or certain age ranges mm -hmm. or certain areas, anything like that? That's I haven't uh, done an analysis on that. At at this time, but that's something to look towards doing in 24. Oh yeah, I'd be really interested in hearing that just to see what's changed. Mm -hmm. And then Jen, you mentioned um, our teams um, connecting with school districts to find out, mm -hmm. will that include homeschooling communities? Should they be available? And then who are the teams? Uh, internal staff or? It would be members of my team, the Outreach and Community Partnerships Division. And this seems like a really good opportunity to mention our universal access program to our e-resources called the Connect Card Program, which we have tried to implement with, as you know, 27 school districts has not been easy, each with varying degrees of technical expertise. But what we do with the Connect Card Program is that a student is given a library account just for our e-resources based on their school ID number. So you may have your private personal library card, but it's streamlined for students in the schools. And if that program is evolved further, I do want us to take a look at how we would work with, um, say, the homeschool academies at the various public schools around the district to make sure that their students are accounted for in that as well. Yeah, and I would love to be a resource for you if you need that, um, especially in rural communities where mm -hmm. uh, internet is limited. And as you know, we don't have the um, hotspots available anymore. Um, so there's some fantastic innovative ways. Uh, well, actually not innovative, more hardcover, regular books, right. increasing access and letting people know about that. So I'd love to be a resource that way. I would love to talk to you about it at some time. <laughs> Thank you, Olga. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'll now close the public comment portion of the public hearing for the 2024 budget. I formally close the public hearing. Next steps are to adopt resolution 2023-26-2024-02, adopting the 2024 budget. I ask for a motion to adopt this resolution as presented. So moved. I'll second. Is there any further discussion? All right, I move this to a vote, please. Megan Dugan? Aye. Penny Love Hensley? Aye. Marianne Duncan Cole? Aye. Olga Hodges? Aye. Marie Coffey? Aye. Vikram Katwani? And Christy Morgan? Aye. Motion to approve the 2024 budget is approved. The public hearing for the 2024 budget approval is now closed. Thank you for your efforts. All right, it's that time of year again where we elect our officers for the 2024 calendar year. These recommendations have been put forward by the nominating committee during our last meeting. Chair Christy Morgan, Vice Chair Megan Dugan, Secretary Marianne Duncan Cole. Are all nominees willing to serve in these roles? I, for one, if elected, am willing. Megan? Yes, I will. I have a conflict after 28 years of looking at minutes as a city administrator. I'm a little bit weary of it, and I don't think I would um, do the effort that needs to be done. So I'd like to pull my name from the uh, nominating list. Thank you. The chair would entertain a nomination, a different nomination for the position of secretary. I would like to nominate Penny Love Hensley to serve as secretary. Penny, are you willing to serve in this role? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I would entertain a motion to elect Christy Morgan as chair for the upcoming year. Can you do it as a state or? Can you do the whole state or? I think it's on this one too. Because if they, if they went over, I see it makes sense. Did you roll call? Do we roll call? Oh, I need a motion and a second first. Oh, I motion for Christy to be chair. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? We can take a roll call vote, please. Uh, Mary Ann Tuckin Cole. Aye. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. Megan Dugan. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. Okay. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Present. Uh, the motion passes. Next, um, I would entertain a motion to elect the vice chair, Megan Dugan. So moved. Seconded. We can take a roll call vote, please. Marianne Duncan Cole. Aye. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. Megan Dugan. Present. Marie Coffey. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion passes. And finally, I would entertain a motion to elect Secretary Penny Love Hensley. So moved. I second. I move this to a vote, please. Marianne Duncan Cole. Aye. Penny Love Hensley. Present. Megan Dugan. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all. Um, so next we will open up for board comments. Does the board have any comments they wish to make? I, sh I do. Um, uh, I want to say welcome again and thank you to Jennifer. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, we are, you know, com coming up on the end of the year, starting a new year. I want to thank everybody that is here that consistently shows up to give comment, uh, to give comment. Uh, a lot of folks are not here. Um, it has been a tremendous year of learning for me and uh, such a privilege to be in this position. Um, I came in to this uh, unprepared, um, uh, unaware, and I feel like I've had a great opportunity to learn, continue learning, um, build some great relationships, um, and uh, just really dive deep into so many of the details that make this place and all the other libraries run, all the fantastic people, volunteers, staff, um, and patrons that make all of this work out. And I'm grateful for everybody here. I know there's things that we think we don't disagree on. I think there's probably more we do agree on. And I look forward to um, stepping into maybe a little bit more of that um, understanding next year. So thank you everybody for giving me a chance. I'm excited to continue this uh, role and I'm so grateful for this awesome board. So that's all I wanna say. I'd like to thank Molly for her report. Uh, I know you haven't been here a long time, but it's great to see the enthusiasm and the creativity you're bringing. Name the fish is a really good one. <laughs> I really like that Leviathan. But thank you for uh, stepping in and, and taking over. And we look forward to seeing what next year does. And Justin, thank you for finishing up on the budget and helping us all to make this transition. This is not going to be easy. There's so much out there. So thank you to you, Justin, and to you, Jennifer, because we're welcoming you. Those are tough comments to follow. I, I wanted to... <laughs> Thank you for having us. I enjoyed your report a lot. I have a dog named Peaches, so that's my favorite fish name. <laughs> any other any other comments? Molly, check out Goldfish on Vacation. <laughs> the setting for the next regular meeting is Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. It will be hybrid and in person at Cascade Park Community Library.
Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Any objections? <laughs> Meetings adjourned. Thank you.